All right, like I said, um, uh, so I have, I have a problem with long titles, but here we are. Um, the session that you're attending today is called From March to Our Lives to Love Simon, Amplifying Authentic Student Voice. Um, my name is Sarah Milianta Laffin, but I go by Millie. I answer to Millie, so you can just call me Millie. Um, I work at Alima Intermediate School in Edo Beach, Hawaii, 76 up. Um, we're at <laughs> seventh grade um, STEM lab teacher, and I teach uh, Project Lead the Way curriculum, and also do some coding with code.org. Um, cool stuff. So you might be wondering, like, how am I here talking about these social emotional needs and issues when I'm the STEM lab teacher? And what I kind of wanted to have that conversation about today is that it doesn't matter your role in, in, in the classroom or in the school, we can find ways to work these together to support um, students who desperately need us. So let's go. Um, okay, um, I'm big about tweeting, and what I want to make sure I see, because there's a lot of tweets going back and forth today, especially at the end of the conference, so if you have questions for me, or you want to show me something that you've done at your school, or connect, um, so my handle is at MillieLaff on Twitter, also on Instagram, but Twitter's easier for the communication. For the purpose of this session, I'm going to go ahead and sort us with hashtag SEL with Millie. So social emotional learning with Millie. That will let me be able to search this and get back to you and communicate with you. Okay, who am I? I promise not all the slides will be this crowded, but I was trying to explain who I am. So it's me. Um, so I'm Sarah, Millie Anthalapin, Millie. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, my, this is my 13th year in education. I've taught uh, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. I've also been a science, technology, and gifted and talented post in Houston, Texas. This is my second year at Alima Intermediate, and I love my job. Um, the, I've done a few other things in education that have gotten me interested in these issues, uh, including being a policy fellow uh, for Leadership for Educational Equity. Um, what I worked with there was um, turnaround schools at the Indiana Department of Education, so working on schools that were about to, the equivalent of losing their WASP accreditation because they've got some issues going on. So I've seen the policy angle. I've been a Fund for Teachers Fellow. Um, seriously, look that up before you leave today. If you have questions, let me know. Fund for Teachers allowed me to go to Greece to, for 10 days to attend some different classes. If you've taught for five years, you're eligible. It's an incredible experience. So Fund for Teachers, definitely check that out. <coughs> um, most recently in Houston, my advocacy work that I was doing was with a group called OneHouston.org. What we did, we came together um, to organize the community. And we asked the community what their biggest issues in education were. I'm oh, sorry, do you need me in the mic? Can you hear the call? Um, caveat, I know I talk fast, so it's not a problem if you need me to repeat myself. I have my kids pat their heads if I'm talking too fast. So I'll try to slow down um, to make sure you can hear me. But with One Houston, the work that we were doing, the community came together and said we had three main problems in Houston to work on. Um, one was fighting the school to prison pipeline. There was a big problems with exclusionary discipline, where we found that certain students were far more likely to be suspended or expelled than other students, and that system was not equitable. So we went to the big school district working on that. We also worked on the immigration and deportation pipeline, because Houston has a big problem. I can get into that all day. But yes, so check it out if you want to see some of that advocacy work. Um, so yeah, I'm at Alima Intermediate. Um, our hashtag at Alima is Alima Way, if you want to look at our school, and our handle is at Alima School. I teach seventh grade Project Lead the Way in, in a STEM lab format. I'm also the speech and debate coach, um, the GSA sponsor. I'm a Donors Choose ambassador, so some of the pictures you'll see in this uh, are going to be like, where did you get that stuff? I'm not independently wealthy, but I do write a lot of grants. So in the last, since 2007, I've gotten about 20 grand from my schools from Donors Choose. It's a great resource. Uh, Donors Choose is incredibly underutilized in Hawaii, so they're a big target area. Especially as we're looking towards the holidays, holidays, it's a great time to get some grants up. You might go pie in the sky and ask for a Chromebook cart with 30 Chromebooks because you never know when like Stephen Colbert is going to fund all these computers. So just think about that um, as it gets closer to break time. And then um, I'm also a Hope Street Hawaii fellow, and that's been an incredible experience. And doing that has kind of brought me here today where I feel like I can kind of tell these stories. So I'm very grateful. Any of those things if you want to ask me about, um, tweet me or let me know and we'll chat. Okay, I, as I was putting the presentation together, you know how when you're at a conference you're learning all these new incredible things? Um, so I have a little caveat before I get going. Um, so this presentation is going to contain data from Glisten Hawaii and the Hawaii Department of Health relating to health and wellness of our LGBTQ plus students. 
So um, while well, well, working to include important information, I'm aware the majority of the material I have is not Hawaii specific, and I just want to kind of say that out front to make you aware. I'm aware, and I'm working to make it better, um, and maybe if you guys have resources, we can work on that together today. Um, GLSEN stands for the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. I believe is what it came down to, but it's pronounced as GLSEN. GLSEN Hawaii has donated a bunch of cards and stickers today that I would love for you to take back to your classrooms. Okay, this is my personal education belief, and I'm just sharing this now. Um, seek education, but do not expect your students or fellow teachers to educate you, and do not ask to be educated before seeking resources yourself. Um, that's something that's just personal to me. I know I'm still fairly new in this community, so it's my responsibility to educate myself about my students, where they come from and their background. And I'm going to show you a few ways that I've tried to do that. If there are things you want to add, please do to this presentation, because I would love to know um, your backgrounds. Um, when I knew that I was um, interviewing to come to Hawaii, there were a few resources that I looked to to try to um, grow myself in knowledge of what I was going to encounter when I came to Hawaii. Um, the first book I read was Sarah Val's Unfamiliar Fishes, which gives kind of a crash course in colonization and Hawaii history. What was beautiful is read the book, went to Bishop Museum, learned a lot about um, history from that part. The Offshore Podcast, I have, I'm obsessed with this podcast. Some of the seasons are better than others, but it did give me a good story of history. I learned a lot about the telescope from Mount Kea. And then the Conversation Podcast is on um, NPR One or HPR here. And I don't catch it every day, but I try to see when issues are up about education. These are things that I go ahead and look to to make sure that I'm educating myself before I ask um, my fellow teachers or I ask questions of my students. I want to seek information first because that's my responsibility to be a culturally responsive educator. Um, continuing, so again, I really worked hard to seek out and I have a cool uh, tool that I found yesterday. I'm taking a class by Auntie Ku called the Pedagogy of Aloha. And it's, it's on the YNI side, but if you look it up on YouTube, she has a few of her classes posted. And for me, again, it's my responsibility as an educator in Hawaii to make sure that I educate myself about my students and my community. We've gone through a lot of really cool sessions. I've, um, the first two have already happened. The next one's on December 6th. She's super welcoming. She tells amazing stories. And I feel like I have learned so much about um, supporting my kids. So if that's something, definitely look her up on YouTube. Um, Yesterday, I saw some, because I know I'm still learning the Hall Framework, um, I saw a session with the Hawaii Teacher of the Year, Matthew Williams, and he shared this incredible website with what his students were doing. This website is beautiful. Please do yourself a service to like go through, because I feel like this is more place-based um, than some of the materials I'm going to talk about today. So I just want to make sure that, um, that we're reaching that background, because that's our responsibility to our students. Maybe pictures or whatever, sorry. I saw some thumbs up. All right, so I will be periodically throughout the session talking about people or groups that I think you should follow. Um, again, looking at the play space. Matthew, that's his Twitter handle. Um, the partner that presented with him yesterday was Bill Chen. He also has great information. And then in Peace Hawaii, um, a lot of good resources for educators to help um, promote um, play space learning and the law framework. So these are great resources for you could, where you could look at that material. I'm still learning every day, and so it's important for me to find um, this material. Does anybody have any other ones you think we should add to this? Like followers I should in terms of local place-based learning. Okay, so I've got a lot of stuff into this session today, and so it might seem like I'm going fast, but I want to make sure I'm honoring your time and the things that we're going to go ahead and look at. So for students, oh, that did not come out well. Sorry, friends. Okay, for student voice, I went with the um, definition from Edutopia, and what Edutopia says about student voice, I know it's a term we use a lot, but I just wanted to give us clarity before we get going today. Um, student voice being how students give their input to what happens within the school and the classroom. Our desire is for students to know that their expertise, opinions, and ideas are valued in all aspects of school life. So what, we're doing, what I'm seeking to do in this session today is amplifying student voice. I think sometimes we say that as teachers, we're, help, we're trying to help students find their voice. And for me, I really want to shift that to say, our students have voice. Like, they, they already have it, and we need to make sure we honor that by amplifying it in the work that we're doing with them and for them. So amplification is the goal. They have the voice already. It's, it's not fair to assume that we're just going to do it all for them. Does anybody, uh, this definition is a work, good working definition, we're cool with it? Awesome. 
Uh, social emotional learning, I know we've seen a lot of sessions on SEL today. Um, I pulled this from, I think it's Castle for the definition, but social and emotional learning is the process of developing and using the skills, attitudes, and knowledge that help youth to identify and regulate emotions, develop positive relationships, and to make responsible decisions. These are the things that we're seeking to do by focusing on social and emotional learning. Um, I find what I do in STEM kind of interesting because I think if you take education back, you know, we were 10, 15 years ago big into standardized testing, right? And then we got into standardized testing and then we said, time out, the kids can't think critically. If it's not A, B, C, D, they're lost. So then we saw this push for STEM. And what we took from STEM was, okay, so now we've got them thinking critically, um, but we've lost the creativity. So now you see that movement more towards STEAM, so science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, and that's kind of where I think of my lab and my responsibility as a STEM lab teacher. I really want to be a STEAM lab teacher. And I want to be able to support these SEL skills as well, even with the content-based standards that I, that I need to cover. Um, Castle gives the like five competencies of social emotional learning, self-awareness, self-management and emotional regulation, social awareness, relationships and social skills, and responsible decision making. Kind of talks about, um, if you've heard in the news lately, soft skills, uh, talking about how um, Google and, and YouTube are coming back and saying, okay, so you've got these kids coding now, you've got STEM, you're pushing problem solving, all right, but our kids can't work in groups very well because they don't have the soft skills to be able to make that happen. Um, my responsibility as a STEM lab teacher is I'm facilitating this group work and the content at the same time. I don't think it's possible to do that work without the social emotional learning piece involved. Um, to get them onboarded to that group work piece. What we used to say 10 years ago was we used to be like, it's okay, if you don't want to work in that group, it's fine, you can work by yourself. Is it okay to work by yourself anymore? Not really. But for the most part, our kids have to be working with somebody else, even if it's not their favorite person. And we have to get them to a place where they can do that and still be successful. Okay, so we're going to chat for a minute. Share with your neighbor a time during your personal K-12 education where you were able to use your student voice and how did it make you feel? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, at Elima Intermediate, where I work, um, my Gender Sexuality Alliance, or my GSA, which was formerly um, a Gay Straight Alliance, is called the Rainbow Royales. And this is a, it is an after school club. But this is also kids that I work with throughout the day. I also have many students who aren't necessarily in the club who will come out and find me. And that's where this, uh, the stickers are so important. And I know it's a little thing. I tried to get you guys safe space stickers because those are something I'm really passionate about. But I have these stickers. I have one on my board. I have two on my outside door. And I'll have kids just come by and be like, hey miss, what's that? What's it about? And they might come by another few days later, and it's a little conversation starter, and I've had so many kids join our club just because you see the sticker, because suddenly they realize, um, to them, this might be a place that they can come talk, or that they can go ahead and be safe. Um, our goal is that kids feel that way in every classroom, but the reality is not always the case. So it's a little tiny thing, um, but displaying it, even on your laptop, um, could make a kid feel feel more supported. And so I have plenty of extra stickers that I would love for you to take. These came from Valor Grimm, um, and they work for Listen Hawaii. Listen Hawaii has an active Twitter and Facebook account, and they're always asking for teachers, what resources do you need? Um, last night I went to Valor's house to pick up some of these materials, but when it comes to different events, there's all kinds of stuff out there, and um, Listen is targeting Hawaii, because we know right now we're kind of in the midst of a bullying problem, mm -hmm. and so we have a lot more of these resources available, and it'd be really awesome to use them and spread out these networks. Which goes to my next slide. Okay, so this is my door at my staff, B102. I have my safe space sticker. Uh, what happened last year is somebody set it on fire. Um, the, there was a GSA poster that one of my kids had made on my door, set it on fire. Um, this quote, I thought this quote was more of a famous quote, but I think it just comes from the West Wing <coughs> when I try to find verify. Um, if you're shooting at you, you must be doing something right. So I think that when I first saw it, I was bummed out. You know, it was my first year at this campus. I've been working really hard to build a community, and I thought I was doing great. Um, but to have um, the accelerant around the door, to have it broken through, um, something's up. <laughs> and 
I remember I was reflecting on it, and I, I, got, I got really upset that day. But what was nice is my administration immediately supported me. They called me, they checked on me, they wanted to talk about it, they wanted to see um, what they could do to support. And the kids saw it too. So what the kids did, it was funny after, not funny, but I mean after they came through, they made me tons of extra posters. Kids who weren't involved with our GSA um, wanted to make sure that the door looked nice, that so they covered up that section. And um, I actually haven't painted over it, because I think for me it's a good reminder of the work I'm doing being important. Um, so if they're shooting at you, you must be doing something right. So it's harder to see on here, but we know that one in 10, this data comes from the health department. So this is local Hawaii data, and I can share both these reports. On the links from the beginning of the session, um, both of those should be hyperlinked as well. So one in 10 public high school students identify as LGB or questioning, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, according to the data. At high school, middle school is a little harder to get because sometimes they combine it with secondary, um, but I wanted to give you the best numbers I could. So uh, 4,700 high school youth here in Hawaii identify as LGB or questioning, which is twice the seating capacity of the Waikiki shell, just to kind of think of the kids that, that we might be working with. Um, we don't always know who these kids are in our midst, and that's again where we want to make sure that we have ways to give them support. This data is going to get kind of heavy, but I promise at the end we're going to come through and work through some, some good ideas. But we know in, in terms of Hawaii, LGBT youth are two times more likely to experience physical or sexual dating violence. Um, they have been bullied, 43% have been bullied either at school or electronically. Um, they're three times more likely to skip school because they feel unsafe. So when I think to my door, um, to a student who already maybe felt unsafe, and suddenly you realize this poster was burned off the door, like, it's my responsibility to make sure that kid has all the more love and support uh, because it's clearly a need. Um, the, when you look at bullied on school property, broken down between heterosexual students, questioning, and LGB. Um, I probably did not come out right that way. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we have up 29% feel like they were bullied, they were bullied on school property. Um, electronically bullied is at the 26% for the community. And um, we know that students skip school because they feel unsafe. Um, to go with that, more than one and three LGB youth have made a suicide plan in the past year. And these are statistics that keep me up at night as an educator. Um, there was new research released last week, and I can link you to that. Um, actually, the Smithsonian Magazine posted this, this article saying that when you have an active GSA on your campus, even if you're not running the GSA, it's just on your campus, suicide rates drop for all students. Um, and that's talking about building allyship, um, building safe space, and the idea that kids know that they have resources to go for. Um, so I think it's all the more important that I feel like I do this work, and I hope that um, this is something you're thinking about either bringing to your campus to go ahead and support. Um, these are kind of, so 40%, um, this is coming from the report on transgender youth, and this one was actually just published by the um, Hawaii Department of Health. So 40% of transgender youth have been bullied either at school or electronically, 29% um, on school property, and uh, 29 also saying electronically bullied. Um, I, I, this, this data is heavy, like I said, I don't know how, um, but it also fuels me to do this work because I understand that this is a need and I had no idea until seeing the hard numbers, like, you know, it's bigger than just my door, if that makes sense. Um, we're looking at kids who are purposely hurting themselves because they feel like they're not accepted or supported where they are. Um, we know the suicide rates and we know the bullying data. It was just on, you just saw it in the headline of the paper, right? Um, Hawaii is having a huge problem with bullying, but so are they having problems nationally. So it's super important that we're supporting this SEL by making sure that all populations feel um, supported. Uh, and it just, it, it just knocks the wind out of you. 38% of these babies have made a suicide plan. And so we owe it to them to give them better support. Um, nearly half of transgender youth have felt sad or hopeless in the past year. Half of transgender youth, this is Hawaii data and it's all in the big, big report. The report has adult data and youth data um, that we're looking at. We know that, um, back to that data again, many skip school. And we know we need them in class with us so they can go ahead and learn and grow and get those tools to go ahead and be more successful. Um, and that, that's the case for all students, but especially for these populations that need that extra love and support. Okay, um, to be able to continue in this work and support that, definitely follow Listen Hawaii. 
Um, great place to access resource, ask questions, they can get you other resources if you need them. Uh, the National Listen has a lot of Twitter chats. This is where I go for my lesson plans for GSA, and I'll navigate that um, in a few minutes so you can see. I think sometimes when parents, when I say that I run the Gender Sexuality Alliance, uh, people get this, this conception that like we're like a dating game or that we're constantly talking about sex. And I will tell you from working with my kids, most of them just want to talk about movies or just sit in a place in a room that they feel comfortable. We're not talking about those issues that you think that sometimes people run away and think that we are. A great uh, another source, Culture of Dignity Lessons. And she's, she runs an incredible Twitter. This lady is the one who wrote Queen Bees and Wannabes uh, that got turned into the movie Mean Girls. I, I saw her at AMLE here in Hawaii last year. She's an incredible speaker to get a chance to um, see her. And I'm going to show you some other lesson plans. Um, just to get, I should have, I read on the roof. How many of you are elementary? Um, how many are middle? And then high school? Okay, perfect. So just kind of see. Um, these are really written for middle and high, but the listen lessons go all the way to elementary, and I'll uh, navigate to those soon. Okay, I click. Are you picturing? You okay. Okay. When I started, um, I understood there was a need for the GSA. I didn't really have structure because it wasn't my background. I just knew that I wanted to support these kids. Um, a great intro to this, if you're not sure if you want to form a club or if you have some, students, some teachers on campus who might be on board with this, is checking out the National School Calendar. What the National School Calendar will organize around from Glisten is um, events that are coming up. So when we started the school year, um, September 24th to 28th was the Allied Week. Um, what we did for Ally Week, they gave us lessons and supports for um, teaching kids how to be good allies, which really counters bullying. There's nothing about that allyship that was directly dealing with sexuality on my campus, but it was giving tools, kids the tools they needed to be not just bystanders, but upstanders um, to support all kids on campus, which we know is going to work to fight that bullying issue. Um, coming up, so it's it, when you, if you're not sure if you have the, the bandwidth right now for a full club, you can still propose these to student government, these dates and events. And again, if you register with Listen and um, contact Listen Hawaii, they'll send you a lot of materials to go ahead and make these events happen. Um, in the links that I sent, their calendar um, is also in that link, and I'll navigate to that for you. OK, so this was our Ally Week. Um, I tried to find some teachers that would, would help me out here. So we had our media teacher, our English teacher, art teacher. It's always good, especially as you're starting these organizations. Um, it's it's nerve-wracking to the kids to not have the example. So sometimes it, you have to put yourself out there and make that example or that exemplar so you can start the conversation. So we just talked about what allies did. So like I like Miss Sock. She said her as an ally, she loves everybody. Um, so I said my allies educate myself, educate themselves. Glisten sent us buttons, stickers, tattoos. Um, great ways to go ahead and support kids. The little tiny buttons, I don't know if you notice right now, are very in, again, where they can express themselves in the lanyard. Um, Hot Topic still has all the buttons. Um, <laughs> go. And um, it's a way that a kid can feel like they're supporting their identity, um, but doing it enough that they feel like themselves, but don't feel too out of it. Um, here, I wasn't sure, and um, every kid in this presentation has photo release forms, so don't worry. But as I got started, I was more worried about anonymity. And it's funny, I freaked out about it, but the kids didn't. <laughs> so as we get closer, so their faces are covered here, not because I'm hiding them, just because I wasn't exactly sure how it all was going to work. Um, we made posters for recruitment um, on campus. Now, this, this came with some issues. Um, we got some creative, uh, some creative uh, graffiti. <laughs> As all of <laughs> us put together. And I kind of, I was kind of not even, I caught the kid doing it and he apologized and I'm making another poster. Um, but, <laughs> but the idea of putting it together, like, this is going to be something that you're going to encounter. And instead of letting it get under your skin, and it did for me at first, but it was like, okay, well, we just make extra posters. And, um, and if you catch somebody in an act, they can help out. It was important to me, so this is actually like a four sided box that we put out behind, beside my door for meetings. So it just kind of lets kids know we're going to go ahead and have a meeting today. Um, what I did, if you haven't started a GSA on your campus, what I, what I did last year that I noticed, we were having them during recess. So when we started our GSA, we had 40 kids come. And I'm so excited. Um, but what started to happen was, because we were calling the meetings during recess, kids started to notice who was coming to my room at recess. And, um, and that didn't bother a certain amount of kids, but my numbers shrank dramatically. 
So this year um, we are doing after school supports. Um, I'll still let them come to my room for recess or we'll do some lunch. But to make sure that we kind of keep the group together and we don't just have kids that come once and don't come back, especially when you know they're interested in being there, um, it's important to me to give them that time. Um, for in the yeah, terms of posters, we try to do more where the kids are going on announcements and just hanging at posters. But um, as we got ready for, you know how we just had Unity Day with the orange? My kids made a lot of posters that it allows them to be creative too, because I have the STEM lab, I have the paints, I have the supplies, so they can come in. Sometimes just working on poster, working on artwork. Um, supports them in that creative process and just gives them, you'd be surprised what kids share when you just give, give them a paintbrush and they just sit there and talk. And that's what a lot of these kids really need in their support structure. Um, some of the sheets, I'm just kind of looking at what they're looking at. It's, it's interesting all their experiences and it, this surprised me as a middle school educator because I kind of didn't know all this was going on. Um, so this baby, my brother's a drag queen that works at Scarlet, so I support everyone. <laughs> Also, my family is very Disney. My family is all about LGBTQ. <laughs> so this baby was an incredible ally. Um, she came ready to work, um, work on stuff. And um, but again, I wouldn't have known that if we wouldn't have like had that conversation. Um, what I saw from a lot of the sheets, for instance, on the one over there, look how much time they wanted to be within a safe space. So like I was trying to figure out one time to do meetings because we knew it wasn't working. But this baby wanted to come lunch before school, after school, and additional recesses. Um, which tells me there's a need, and so how do we how do we create that safe space where that child feels supported? So I really support the LGBT community, and I don't really know what gender I like. <laughs> also, um, I'm also an artist and play the bassoon in band with my best friend Gia. <laughs> I'm just like putting together um, just just little things where you're getting to know who they are um, as they're starting to come into their own. Um, this baby. I'm going through a rough time and what's happening in, uh, is my mom left my dad and went to Washington and I, and I have friends who um, who's bi and gay and people are making fun of me uh, for being their friend. Um, that's a really, really common thing that I see from, from my kiddos. So even though this kid is not necessarily identifying um, as LGBTQ+, they still need the strategies, they still need to understand how to, um, to handle those situations, how to support their friend. Um, and how to support themselves. Um, <laughs> Lex is amazing, and going to be president someday. Um, but Lex prefers he, him pronouns, or they, them. <laughs> Alex, not Alexis, yikes. Um, I'm pansexual. <laughs> Salad works as a name to ha, like all of these. Uh, but very open, but again, somebody who needs, that this person, this baby wanted to be all the time. <laughs> and I was like, you can't stay in my room all day, every day. We've got other stuff that we've got to get accomplished. Did I hear that question? Sorry. Squirrel. Okay. Uh, as we were getting our DSA going, we started to try to find things to do positively. Keeping the calendar, um, we were working on, um, there's a great one coming up, No Name Calling Week, and that can just be campus-wide. It doesn't necessarily have to be anything that's related to genders and sexualities, but it can be for those students who need it. Um, this, this was amazing to see, and I wish I had another picture, but I don't. But so um, one of my students put this blue chalk everywhere and ask the kids to step here if they were called a mean name. And by the end of like the end of recess, you just saw blue everywhere. Um, you put it in a place, and those visuals reminders also um, makes the kids feel less isolated. So they understand that um, it doesn't make it right what they're going through, but that other people are experiencing it. So how can we form community to make sure that's not something we're dealing with? The power of positive notes. So for no name calling week, um, these ladies, and that's me taking a bad selfie. <laughs> um, <laughs> But just put amazing notes all over the bathroom mirrors, supporting um, our, our students, or our ladies, um, telling them they're amazing, you're awesome, you can do anything, take what in them, it says up there, think good things, uh, take what you need. And it was funny because we just did it for no name calling week, but what actually happened was girls kept getting post-it notes and kept adding. So you go into the restroom, because the janitor was like, Ms. Millie, what happened? And I didn't realize that they kept up with it. So they're like, you're better than him. Or like, you know, like giving them like support, like girl power, all of this. Um, and so it did come from a GSA lesson, but it permeated throughout the campus to support the learning of the other kiddos. Uh, chalk has been an amazing ally, except I will say I was not a great chalk regulator in the beginning. So chalk would get stolen and you'd find big phallic pictures on walls. So I have to be careful with my chalk regulation. Or what I also do is now I have big, big like pictures of water so I can go survey and see if anything else got drawn. 
Um, but just the idea of positive slogans, they only last for a few days, but the kids understand this deeply. They're, they've all gone through some sort of bullying, especially as um, you know, social media and behind the screens, they can hide behind it. Uh, but don't be the bully, be the upstander. Um, be kind, everyone, everyone is a story that you know nothing about. Don't be mean behind the screen. Um, these notes, it, it didn't take much, and this took five, ten minutes out of a normal STEM class period to go ahead and do, to go ahead and encourage, but we also did it for recess and some other times. This is my favorite. You are not what they say you are. Concise, small, just a reminder of, like, you, your bully does not define you, and we need to make sure that our kids understand that. Other events, um, this is, uh, listen to why, this is Valor, and Valor came and dropped off a bunch of stuff um, for Ally Week stickers. You'll see, um, I think there's some Ally Week stickers going around, um, to you if you want to grab any of these, the different pieces. Um, this one was for No Name Calling Week, so it was defining like who you were. I started to invest as teachers started to hear about it too, because I was already kind of the weird teacher, this is kind of my, my role. Um, but I've been, other teachers would kind of appear and be like, how can I help? What can I do? Or my kids my kid said, you really made them feel better, can you show them what you did? And it's a little way, so it's, it's not only helping those students, but also permeating it into school culture in a way that supports everybody. Um, day of silence, it's, that's a, it's a tougher one, I think, for middle school, maybe it's more for high school. Uh, it's towards the end of the school year, and they ask students to be silent for the whole day um, to, to honor the memories of people we've lost in the community. Um, they, have, they get given little cards they can hand out. For me, I just told my kids they could be silent at recess or in my class, but I, I just didn't want to start that, like, oh, I don't have to do my project. No. Like, you still have to talk in your other classroom. But they really took it to heart. They did the research. They created it. Um, a lot of what we do, um, just the art piece, again, going back to that STEM, that STEAM, where they can go ahead and create things that matter to them. Um, they love the chalk. The chalk is great. And kids love signing the chalk messages to say, like, this message is from me. I'm putting it together. Uh, this was something that was really special to me, and this, this happened this year. So um, that's my GSA president, vice president, and secretary. And this, again, started with a sticker on the door. So a sticker on the door. Reese is a new student this year. And um, Reese had kind of been hanging out by my door. And I, you, know, you can kind of get the messages. You're like, oh, hey, what's up? What's going on? Um, let's talk about um, what you're doing in school. And so she'd come by two or three times. And finally, she's like, hey, can I talk to you? Like, you know, I saw your sticker. It's like, sure, what do you want, what do you want to know? And um, she came with the most drawn up proposal. She wanted to go to my principal, uh, Chris, uh, Principal Chris Manila, and she wanted to see if our GSA, first of all, she wanted to join GSA. And then she wanted us to march in Honolulu's Pride Parade that was on October 20th. Um, for me, <laughs> that, was a, that was a big ask, and I didn't know what to do with that. And these are, these are situations that are still new to me, and I'm trying to find a way, how do I channel this so that their voice is being honored? Um, but not, that conversation is not for me. So it was my job as the educator to arrange the meeting. So I said, if you're going to have a meeting with the principal of the school, you better have all your notes ready. You better have rehearsed and practiced. And, and I'll go ahead and bring the conversation. And um, Mr. Vanilla gave her 20 minutes where she outlined all the reasons that she really wanted to march um, in the Pride Parade. And um, it, was, it was deep because I think sometimes when we give kids that platform, they blow you away. Like the, um, the research, the, she had footnotes, she had all these other things of saying why our school should get to go. She also wanted to connect with other GSAs um, in our complex to be like, how do we go together? How can we do this stuff? Um, and, and make it happen. And um, what it, it was a tight turnaround on timing. So what we were able to do for Pride was that parents were able to transport kids. Um, I was uh, we were able to walk. Uh, Valor arranged for us to walk with um, HSTA um, with Listen. So we were able to meet up with other students there. I would have liked to have taken everybody, but um, it was just anybody could get transportation there. Hopefully next year uh, we'll have a more developed plan to support these kiddos. Um, but we had a great time at Pride. And this was a first for me, and I thought it was really neat. This is a, a student, Danae, and Danae's parents came with, which just like blew me away, because sometimes, um, kind of like the data that we, were, we saw earlier, it's heavy. <laughs> like, um, so to see parents who are asking me, like, how do I support my kid, like that just, your heart just soars. So it's, uh, so, and I don't always know, but I'm gonna go ahead and find that resource, because those parents were <laughs> loud and proud and ready to support their baby, um, which was really uplifting for the rest of my kids. So um, yeah, so it's my art teacher, 
some more of my kiddos, and we met up with some other GLSEN kiddos from around who, uh, who came. Um, they brought their signs put together. So again, they're creating their art, they're telling their story, and they're being able to be who they are in a way that community. So like, um, here, tear up. But it was uh, Tempest, she, so sweet. But um, she was there, we had some beautiful, beautiful drag queens who were walking around. She'd be like, Miss, can you go ask her if I can have a picture? And I'd say, okay, picture. And so what she said to me is, as we're walking, walking through Waikiki, we're in this parade draft, she's like, look at all these people like us. Like, and the sense that often you feel your community is the three other kids on campus, but then you see how wide your community is. It's beautiful. So we got to march um, with a bunch of other kids, again, so find a community. Again, smaller over there. And then different people who came together. We, um, HSCA had really cool tie-dye shirts, so if you're able to go to next year's Pride, I suggest it. It was great, great fun. We went from Magic Island all the way through um, Waikiki, and then that's where the Pride Festival was. The kids had an amazing time, and it was hard because like, um, we use, is anybody familiar with the app Band? So Band is like, like a Facebook that's private. So it's like a feed we use to communicate. I don't, um, I really don't like texting students. You know, it has to be kind of an emergency thing, so I like that it's an isolated platform where we can communicate as a group. It's a little less formal than Google Classroom, but they can still post questions and updates. So as we were marching, the kids who aren't there are watching us on TV and commenting online and on social media um, and still getting to engage even though they weren't. And hopefully that, what we hope is it'll build the interest so next year we can make it a bigger event. Um, the, so this sign I still have in my classroom. Um, proud teacher of all my students. And you'd be surprised of um, what builds conversation? So it's kind of like, hey, Miss, what's that mean? And it's like, I love all of you. I don't care where you come from. I don't care your story. You're here. You're my kids. And um, little messages like that, it doesn't have to be a big thing, but it's kind of like the sticker, right? Um, it kind of puts through that you really care to support them for who they are. And my amazing friend, Jill, helps me pull all the kids' pride stuff all the way through the parade. Shout out to Jill. Sparkles. <laughs> Okay, so what I didn't, again, <laughs> I feel like all of this is a story of unintended, oh, what happened after the fact. So getting involved with the GSA, um, Parkland happened. So you know the shooting happened at the high school in Florida. And the GSA kids were really, really um, into this because you had Emma Gonzalez on the front lines talking about um, her experience and really eloquently talking about what it mattered to them and how they started to organize after that happened. Um, my kids were lit up by this on social media. And so they come to me and they say, hey, um, miss, I, how about we walk out of school? <laughs> I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm going to get right. Um, so I was like, OK, <laughs> let's arrange that meeting. Let's have that conversation. Um, because this, again, this is all new territory for me. This is not my background. But they're coming to me with an interest and a voice, and I want to be able to support that. So we <laughs> talked about, um, they, planned it, they planned everything. So I gave them the space in the classroom, but this was their responsibility to put this together. Um, what these amazing kiddos figured out was instead of doing a walkout last year, they wanted to do a teach-in. Um, so they wanted to invite the kids to walk out in the field, and they wanted to talk about um, lessons and teaching that matters to, to them about gun violence and violence in general. Um, and they performed, and it was pretty, pretty powerful. So we planned it out. We had rehearsals, they made signs, they put it together. Another note just for SEL, um, my classroom it kind of gets intense, but I part of creating a classroom is letting the kids also help in that process, because this is their learning space. So I do give them that time when, um, if you have those fast finishers who finish stuff or different projects. So I want them to design their learning area so that it honors them and where they come from and what they believe. So you'll see a lot of, a lot of color in my room. Um, we said, so, funny, not funny story, but we had SBA testing, so we have a normal stage by the cafeteria, but it was too close to the testing room, so we modified, because that's what we do in STEM, so we went up to the second story, and we faced everybody in the field, we had a poster, we did a gong ceremony where the kids each read a name of one of the shooting victims, we hit the gong, um, and to honor that, the, kid, the, the kids did it themselves, like, you know, I was there in support, but again, this wasn't, it's not my voice, it's theirs, um, putting the whole piece together. Um, Glisten did send more awesome resources. I really liked the le youth lead. Uh, the kids, um, so you see posters for each of the students who were lost. We kind of decorated that around the cafeteria after we had the event. Um, this one, I like, it's like they're super serious. So this one actually went viral because um, a lot of what I do 
and for the case of so, so the photo release forms and all that's covered, um, we do tweet a lot. I'm, I'm constantly using Twitter um, to kind of tell the story of what we're doing on campus and in our community and to try to build community wider than just our classroom. You know, so that Tempest doesn't have to go to a parade to see that her community is everywhere. So this was after we had the walkouts, it was talking about Columbine, how many school shootings we've had, and the idea of that this is, this is the future and they, they have this voice already, and so how do we amplify it into activism that is meaningful to them and still in their work? I don't know, it kind of played funny a minute ago. But I just wanted you to get a sense of like, okay, it also was like super windy, but you had the students below, um, so you had seventh and eighth graders there putting together, they have notes, I have my secretary, you know, taking different views, they have scripts, they have things that they're sharing. I wonder if it, did I do it? Maybe. Um, I broke it. Well, I, she reads a poem, but you can see. So, <laughs> again, <laughs> unintended consequences, it keeps going. So we walk out, we do this teach-in, the kids are super pumped, they feel really proud of themselves, they feel inspired to keep going. So what the Parkland students asked the kids to do on social media um, was to request during the recess, um, I guess this would have been like March, that every congressperson meet with students when they went home for recess. And so my kids got on Town Hall Project and realized that um, even though all the kids were supposed to be met with, that for some reason, um, Congressman Representative Hanabusa hadn't scheduled a town hall for our lives. And that was the next step in the activism process. So they wanted to go on Twitter and they wanted to ask her to have a town hall. Um, and so it, it, we joined in the speech and debate club, so a lot of these kids overlap in the clubs and work. So again, hey boss, I'm not starting to try to start trouble, but <laughs> um, can we do this? So. They posted this, because again, nobody from the Hawaii won, there was nothing planned at all. Not even like go to the library, not even wave at some kids, nothing was planned um, when all over the nation, every rep was meeting with their constituents. And talked about how just because they can't vote doesn't mean they don't have a right to ask their politicians to go ahead and, and, and listen to their voice as well. So put it on Twitter, didn't think anything of it. Woke up in the morning, viral. <laughs> uh, so what happened was she came to our campus. So, um, you know, the students were able to use their voice, collective act, action, community organizing to pull it together to go ahead and make their legislative official accountable to what they wanted to talk about. Um, it was just pretty powerful. We were able to do it in the library. Again, SBA testing kind of got in the way, so we only had about half an hour. Um, but it was really, again, the, the, the faces, like, what did I see? Like, they were just, they were so proud of themselves. And, and no lesson I created could have done that. Like, um, to give them that ownership. Um, she, she, she did speak very over their heads, but we translated it out later. But again, it was just the point of getting an audience, right? Um, okay, so the next thing I'm gonna, so I've gone through that, and I'm so sorry, when's my end time today? Four, now? Yeah. No. 11 minutes, thanks boss. Okay, so in terms of setting the stage for SEL, one thing I've learned about it in this process is it has to be something that is, um, is going to work for you. You can't just take somebody else's methods and say, I'm so going to go ahead and work with it. It's got to be something that you can do. I'm just going to show you some ways that I've made my room more comfortable um, to make these conversations conducive. Um, I'm a big believer. I, as a student, um, and I'm just going to be honest, I had a pretty wicked case of ADHD. I still do. Um, sitting still drives me crazy. <laughs> so Especially sitting still in a desk all day long. I, it was just not for me. And I found that's the case with a lot of my kids. So I've got a couch in my room. Um, bean bags all came from Donors Choose. These, these $10 little bath mats also came from Amazon, but through Donors Choose. We call them magic carpets. So once they're into doing independent work, they can work anywhere in the room. They can lay them down, they can sit, they can talk as long as they're doing their work. It doesn't bother me. Um, and again, that's up to personal discretion if it works for you. I work towards, um, Handling those microaggressions, so my students, when I started, um, would say, that's so gay, all the time. Or I'd call kids gay boy. And I realized, you know, sometimes giving that behavior attention is not positive. So it's like, it's not going to help me and be like, okay, I'm going to give you a lecture. So what we did is we turned it into learning vocabulary. So here's my deal. So if I hear it, you better read the poster. <laughs> so I think I just heard you say, that's gay. Here are some other things you can say instead. So we talk about how, um, if that's what you're using for vocabulary, we have different opportunities for you to learn some other words. 
And sometimes, and it's not meant to embarrass, I help them pronounce that, but it's like, okay, if you can't say, I love how they say for insipid, they always say stupid. Um, but like, going through the words, if you don't know all these words on this list, we've got to grow your vocabulary because you need to get better. Um, and it kind of takes, it redirects the conversation, it lets, and make sure that kid knows that I saw that. And you know, and you don't know who in your classroom is suddenly feeling supported or feeling called out. Um, and sometimes as teachers, we don't get to know that. Um, but I just want to hope that if there is somebody in there, that same kid who's buying that sticker, that it's meaningful to them. We use donors to use all the time. Um, I, I wish I had a million dollars. I like to write grants um, to try to get stuff. Uh, currently, our air conditioning is broken, so we got a Dyson fan that's been helping a little bit. But um, donors choose is where it's at. Right now, there's a lot of funding on SEL for donors choose, so definitely check it out and hit me up if you have questions. Um, <laughs> it's a silly thing, but I believe in family photos um, of different groups in the classroom, so I kind of think the weirder selfie, the better. And just kind of, and we'll post these around the classroom or post them on social media, just to go ahead and make sure people feel included. And it, it's a little tiny thing, but the kids will be like, hey, you didn't post the one from yesterday, so they know. And it's a way to just make sure that they understand that we're, we're a learning community. Uh, another thing I'll do often, again, because my classroom gets very warm, um, but we'll go have outside teaching day. You know, I am lucky enough to teach STEM, and I have a lot of resources where it's like, okay, we're going to go learn in the courtyard. We're going to go learn in a different space. I'm switching it up, and it just can kind of take that pressure off, especially those high-stress days where they have a lot of tests. Um, and that's an opportunity. And I do feel very lucky as an elective, because I do think I have a little bit more of that ability to make that work. Um, honoring names is, and I know it's such a little thing that we think about, but um, again, I'm, I'm bad with names, and I'm so sorry if I've met you friends, but I make myself flashcards. So I take a photo with a nameplate of every kid in my classroom. Um, I write it out phonetically, and I just do it until I can get everything. Um, for the rest of my life, I remember last year, I had a baby walk in, and she's like, well, miss, just call me Phi. Um, no white people can say my name. And I was like, okay, well, come teach me. And it took time and time and time, but I will for the rest of my life remember if I'm all the Allah Tawa forever. And uh, it, it's important that we honor their names. It's important that we understand that that is who they are. Um, and so if that means that I'm doing a little extra homework, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the bean bags, all this, they're still doing exactly the work that I assigned, and it's not, it's not bothering anybody else. Um, oh, norming. Norming is huge. Like we uh, we kind of we create norms all the time. This was what I did for a teacher training, so like that we would use that part. But just always making sure that we're going back to that. Sometimes I think as teachers, you know, when we go to PDP and we're just like, oh, no more norms. Okay, handle yourself. You're an adult. Okay. Um, but it is critically important because my job as a STEM teacher is to make sure they work in groups. Um, and the norms, what, when you let kids norm themselves. They, it, it stops the problems in group work. Because it's not saying, hey, I'm saying you're not doing your job. I'm saying, watch your air time, because that's one of our norms. Can you get back on track? And it, um, it takes the conflict out of, um, out of the group work, which is really important. And again, um, I often say my classroom looks like I'm losing a game of Jumanji. Um, but it is their space. And so I want to honor their work. So sometimes it looks cluttered and messy, um, but it is their learning space, and it's theirs to design. I, um, I threw out rules, and this was just something that I had seen. Um, I'm a big fan of the podcast to nearly Cult of Pedagogy, and she has a blog as well. And um, she got rid of rules and made community guidelines. So we wrote these together. So um, it's easy for me to refer back to my community guidelines. They don't sound punitive. We're just talking about how we can um, work together to build this community. And that first one is super important to me, that I'm going to respect you and your point of view. You know, if I gotta get you back on track, that's my job as your teacher, um, but I will always respect you first. Um, and that's something that comes back to it, and, and I can use that again. You miss, because again, I believe we really have to make sure there are no bad kids, there are just bad choices. And um, when we kind of communicate that, that takes the pain out of that interaction and we can get back on track. And even though it's a two minute timeout, hey, go chill out, come back to our community, um, everybody's part of the community no matter what. Um, I'm not somebody who really, um, if it's super violent or something, I will, I will write it. I've not written, I've written one referral in two years. I don't believe in it. Um, I don't want to give my control over that, and I also don't want to make that child feel like they're not welcome in our learning community. Um, so, oh, this is our This Is Us board. So kids will regularly put like photo collages up here. These are some of our stuff from our GSA meetings. But that board is also there for the kids to design. Um, scholastic reading. Um, 
So I, so I really, really encourage reading. Scholastic helps because if you do book orders, you get free points to get extra books for your classroom. Again, I'm a STEM teacher, but literacy is everybody's responsibility. Um, we do AR on our campus, but um, doing the book orders is another way to encourage inclusive literature. Um, and so I always try to use the bonus points to get diverse literature um, into my classroom. And the kids really enjoy that. Um, as we are a STEM classroom, I'm, I, I'm still tied to those ideals. <coughs> The kids have to have a safe space, whether it's to fail socially or fail academically. Um, your best teacher is your last mistake, and that's okay. We don't penalize mistakes in my room. Um, to fail is just your first attempt in learning. And that's something we use it over and over and over um, because that makes the space um, better for all of our learners. I have these links that are in your handout. I'm going to kind of go over them. But oh, this one I do want to show you. So uh, Rosalind Wiseman, she's the one who wrote Queen Bees and Wannabes. Um, she has a bunch of books on the ALMLE website that help with like advisory lessons and social skills, but on the ADL website, she has about 40 lessons that are free. They're already pre-written. Any session that I want to do for teachers, for me, when I'm sitting in a session, I want something I can do in my classroom tomorrow. Um, so if you want to grab this, and these are on the links, and I'll post them at the end as well, and put them on Twitter for you. Um, tons of material about bullying, cyberbullying, prevention. Um, really, really good lessons that my kids love, because uh, does anybody do second step? So we do second step, um, my kids are kind of, kids in middle school have a really good BS detector. <laughs> and so sometimes like the social skills trials and second steps are like, oh no, Sally lost her pencil. And it just, it doesn't feel authentic. Um, I find that the lessons here are way more real world. Um, you do need it, it's not something you can't pre-read. You gotta go through them first so that you know, because um, they can be kind of a heavier topic, but it's stuff that the kids share amazing lessons from. Um, I'm running fast. The Glisten website, I told you, um, has great stuff. So you have GSAs and student clubs, different uh, links to lessons, and these work for elementary through high school. I think we even have some college, and I can show you that in a moment to explore. Um, I know I'm running out of time. Okay, so um, to see some classrooms, just another, the links that we shared today are here, the links that I want to go ahead and put through. If you want to check out other classrooms, um, virtual Open House HI was a hashtag started at the beginning of the school year where we walked through a bunch of different classrooms, um, my classroom included. So I would love for you to put your space on Twitter and share it so we can get some ideas of where everybody else is working and how, how your classrooms are set up to support SEL. With the Anti-Defamation League lessons, they're called Classroom Conversations through her thing, and now the Wi-Fi is going to be weird. So the lessons are all put down here for um, how to help. So like the idea is kids are going to get in trouble. So how do we find ways to help them out? All the social media armor is an incredible lesson if you're having issues with cyberbullying. The kids really get deep in that. But all these lessons are fully there and free. Um, and you don't need to pay for her book to get them. For the Glisten site, if you go up to teach, there's a ton of resources and development. So the educator guy, this also works. I did have a parent ask to be like, so what are you doing in there anyway? So I can go ahead and include, um, so there's your school calendar, um, educator guides for the different events that you have going on. Terminology has been really helpful because I'm learning a lot of terminology I didn't know. Um, I, I don't have a psych background, so the kids teach me. Um, tons of resources here to help out and support kiddos on the Glisten website. That one. One more. Okay, this is the link page. Every picture on here is hyperlinked, and that's the one that I that I shared, and I'll put up again just to go through all the resources we did. The last one I didn't have a chance to cover. Um, in my own classroom, when kids are fast finishers, I always set up SEL projects they can work on. One that's been really powerful is called um, This I Believe Statement. It used to be a segment on NPR. It's like three to five minute speeches about what the kids believe. I play this kid's example as like a little seven-year-old talking about what he believes. Sometimes they're longer. Um, I have learned so much about my kids this way. Sometimes they share them, sometimes they don't. But kids always know, in my room, you're never done learning. You might have finished the standard base task I gave you, but everybody knows what they move on to next. Um, and, and we'll have some of these probably published on Twitter pretty soon. Culture of Dignity, that's the, um, her free lessons are on the ADL site, but she also has a lot of cool material here. If AMLE brings her back, I really suggest seeing her. Uh, she's got a lot, her framework is, our kids are gonna screw up, so how do we support when they do? Because we've been teaching like, one selfie ruins your life forever, um, that you post on Instagram, but we know kids are gonna do it. So how do we set that framework to go ahead and bring them back? 
and Cult of Pedagogy, her podcast and her resources on Teachers Pay Teachers are amazing. Um, I really, really highly recommend it. And unfortunately, she says not to, she says um, to curate, not dump resources, and I feel like I've dumped a little bit, but there's so much cool stuff that I wanted to show you. Um, so I want to honor your time. Thank you so much for hanging out today. That's good.